Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great privilege to be here to address you at this conference. Uh, I must confess that I've obviously struggled to follow many of the proceedings of the conference because my German is non-existent. But uh, I, I have had the opportunity to engage with various people and to listen to some of the presentations. And in many ways, it's a great opportunity to talk about OER in a context in which I don't have to make the case for OER because I think it's clear from the deliberations that we've had so far that I'm preaching to the converted. So, in general, I don't think that there's a particular requirement for me to try to persuade you that open licenses for educational content make sense. So, that introduced a bit of a challenge for me to say, well, what could I say that might be, on the one hand, useful, on the other hand, hopefully slightly provocative and challenging on a Sunday afternoon? And this is the, the line of thinking that I went through. Um, coincidentally and fortunately, as I was traveling here, I happened to be reading an autobiography by a professor called Tim Noakes, who is a sports scientist at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, Tim Noakes is quite famous in the running world, um, firstly because he wrote a, a very well-respected book called The Law of Running, but also because he single-handedly waged a battle against the American sports drink industry over about 20 years um, to argue against the case for over-drinking during running and other endurance events. Um, it's a possibly not very well-known fact here that uh, when Gatorade was first invented, one of the first things that they did was actually invest very heavily in... E capturing the scientific research market in a way that enabled them to persuade athletes that they should drink more while they were running, and that what they should be drinking should not be water, but of course Gatorade. Um, as a consequence, actually, of the advice that they were giving, and they funded something called the American College of Sports Medicine, which provided official guidelines to American athletes over many years, they very sadly, unfortunately, generated a new problem called exercise-associated hyponatremia. Excuse my pronunciation of that. But that is a condition in which over-drinking during endurance events actually causes athletes to go into some kind of toxic condition and in the worst-case scenario is actually to die from drinking too much water during events. Um, he ran a series of scientific exercises to prove that actually this was a bad idea but despite the fact that he managed to prove that conclusively in 1981, it wasn't until the early 2000s that the formal guidelines were in fact reversed. And during that time, several more runners died during endurance events as a consequence of this bad advice. In the autobiography, he subsequently also talked about another phenomenon that he's experienced, which is that he is predisposed towards diabetes. He's now in his mid-60s, and um, despite following a very healthy lifestyle, eating well, or so he thought, exercising regularly, he's been discovering that his predisposition to diabetes is getting worse, and the condition is developing further. And so this prompted him to engage in a number of quite radical lifestyle changes, the most radical of which at the time was that he adopted a high-fat, high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet which, for those of you who know anything about nutrition, is pretty much the opposite of everything that you are told to do by nutritionists. He discovered within literally weeks that he started losing weight. Uh, his running times went from seven minutes a kilometer back to five minutes a kilometer, despite the fact that he's 64. And this prompted him to try to understand why it was that the advice about high-fat diets is so entrenched in the nutritional discourse. So what he did is he went back, did the research, and discovered that this advice is largely based on research that was done in the 1950s by a scientist called Dr. Ansel Keys. Dr. Keys did an analysis of the correlation between societies that have set high saturated fat diets and the incidence of heart disease in those countries. Did an analysis of seven countries, and he proved a correlation 
between a high saturated fat diet and high incidence of heart disease. What Tim Noakes discovered is that, unfortunately, he also neglected data from another 15 countries that he potentially had at his disposal, which, if he would have plotted on the same graphs, would have actually yielded a very different finding that the correlation was non-existent. So this is back in the 1950s. Since that time, though, that respected academic research has found its way into almost all nutritional advice, despite the fact that when you analyze it, there's next to no evidence that actually the dietary advice being prescribed of a low animal fat diet, low protein and high carbohydrate diet is actually good for you. And in fact, what we're discovering more recently is that in many respects, it might be the case that the opposite is true and that in fact, one of the significant causes of the prevalence of lifestyle diseases in the Western world is in fact a high carbohydrate, high fructose or high sugar diet. And we actually see the consequences of this problem playing itself out all over the world at the moment as rates of obesity are climbing through the roof. So you might be asking yourself, what does any of this have to do with open educational resources or OER? And for me, it's really, really critical because I think what the story of how a research project in the 1950s has led to the propagation of bad nutritional advice over 50 years demonstrates to me is, number one, that once you get information into the formal canon, the formal curriculum, it proves remarkably difficult to get it out again. So even though we now actually know for sure from the scientific evidence that these correlations are false, it continues to be the basis on which the vast majority of nutritional advice is being supplied. And the converse holds true as well. We also know now for sure that fructose, particularly in the form of processed sugar, is both toxic and addictive and very bad for you. It's very difficult to get it out of the formal canon, partly because it's being protected by commercial interests, but also partly because those formal systems are very resi resilient or resistant to information change. But I think that what this also demonstrates to me, just as one simple case study, is that we are seeing all over the place that scientific research and new knowledge being generated at the pace at which, at which it's being generated in the world today is overturning so many of the core assumptions on which we base what we do. Another really excellent example of that, which is more specific to education, is in the field of neuroscience. In the last 10 to 15 years, the knowledge that we're gaining about how the brain functions is overturning many assumptions that we have about learning and about how humans work. Unfortunately, though, what we discover is that many of the pedagogical theories on which our education systems are based are still based on cognitive theories that have already been disproven. So we already know that certain things are not correct. We don't necessarily know what is correct. And yet, our teacher education systems continue to teach pedagogical theories that are based on incorrect information. And what we also see from the examples, both of the high-fat, low-fat uh, combination and the waging of war with the American sports industry, is that we are increasingly finding ourselves in a world in which we cannot know for sure whether or not the information that we are reading is right or wrong. And that happens regardless of whether or not the information that we are engaging with comes from an apparently trustworthy source. So if we look at some of the examples that I've described, we're actually looking at sources of information that are apparently trustworthy. Peer-reviewed journals, for example. It turns out, unfortunately, that in the case of Gatorade, they just bought out the journals that were producing the articles. And we all know that if you're so inclined, it's actually quite easy to manipulate the peer review process to make sure that you only pass the journals onto those, the journal articles onto those people who will endorse what you're saying. So when Professor Noakes was trying to have his articles published, he was finding that they were being rejected all of the time because they were being peer reviewed by scientists who were in the paid employment of Gatorade. 
And that's not a once-off phenomenon. Anyone who believes it is, I can regale you with endless anecdotes about the extent to which it isn't. Again, though, you might be asking yourself the question, what has this got to do with OER? I think it's got everything to do with OER because I think that we have to ask ourselves why this situation persists. What is it about our education systems that gives such tremendous resilience to information even when it's starting to become clear that that information is inaccurate? How do we continue to dispense nutritional advice through education that we know is wrong, for example? Or why do we continue to teach pedagogical theories that are based on neuroscience that has now been disproven? And to do that, or to understand that better, I think it's important to go back a little bit in history and think about where the origins of our education systems come from. Because they come from a time which is completely different from the time in which we find ourselves now. Our education systems, both university and schooling, are actually designed and developed for and in a world in which information was A, a scarce resource, and B, in which new knowledge was generated very, very seldom. So if we go back to medieval times when the modern form of the university emerged, the idea of lectures and the passing on of information by experts actually made a lot of good sense at that time because it was very difficult to come across that information from other places. There were very few sites of expertise in which new knowledge was being generated. And so bringing together academics and students into that traditional lecture mode was actually, relatively speaking, quite an efficient way of transmitting information. Moving on to just before the, Prus uh, the Industrial Revolution, when the Prussian model of schooling was developed, that model of schooling, which was then taken up in its first form on a large scale by uh, England as part of the development of the Industrial Revolution, also made quite a lot of sense as a schooling model because, again, information was quite expensive. Human labor was, relatively speaking, quite cheap. And so putting teachers into classes of students where they would get the communication or the, the curriculum talked to them by the teachers was quite a sensible way of doing things. Handily, it also prepared the vast majority of students going into those systems, whether it be university or schooling, for the kind of career that they would find when they came out the other side. In the case of schooling, it prepared the vast majority of students for the reality that they were going into industry, that their jobs were actually going to be mundane, boring, and the information that they would need to learn in order to do their jobs wouldn't change very much during their lives. In the cases of universities, preparing people for professions into which they would move as professionals and then execute their, again, their jobs without significant expectation of the disciplinary knowledge on which their professions was based changing much over the course of their lives. The reality, of course, is that the world in which we now live is a completely different world from that one. So now, what we have instead is a world in which information is overabundant. I think one of the major challenges that we face as human societies is actually that from an evolutionary perspective, humans are not very well equipped to deal with too much choice. And yet that is the world that we occupy now, a world in which there is so much information that we actually don't know what to do with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Simultaneously, that explosion of new knowledge is taking place and expanding itself into new sites all the time, and that makes it increasingly difficult for us to know what's good information and what's bad information. That's being driven, of course, by this massive disruption caused by the penetration of ICT into our societies. We know that devices have got so cheap and diverse that they're almost ubiquitous, particularly in the developed world. Bandwidth has got so cheap that open access to the internet is a reality for the vast majority of people living in the developed world. And this proliferation of information is being provided to us, to our students, to our teachers, through both the devices and those internet connections. And so we're caught in this paradoxical situation where on the one hand, we have education systems designed for a world in which information was scarce. 
and we have students and teachers living in a world in which information is overabundant. And the real difficulty that we're facing is learning how to deal with that reality. I find it a sad situation, in fact, that if we look at social systems in general, the only social systems really that have demonstrated no particular tendency to transform themselves as a consequence of various of these changes and developments in society are, in fact, our education systems. So our education systems are supposed to be the systems that are preparing our students to cope with the world into which they will enter. And yet they are the ones that least reflect anything of the kinds of broader changes that have taken place in society. My contention has been, for some time, that the development of this concept of openly licensed materials provides another moment for us to grapple with the need to transform our education systems. I hope it's clear from what I've said so far that we simply cannot afford education systems that are preparing students for a world which stopped existing 30 to 40 years ago already. And which, in fact, the further that disruption of technology takes us, the less well they are preparing us. It's, in my view, not coincidental that everywhere in the world, with, I suppose, some outlier exceptions, we will find that youth unemployment rates are running at double the unemployment rate of the broader society. Our children, our youth, are being educated in a way that is simply not helping them to deal with the consequences of this social change. And again, I repeat the point that ICT is a disruptive change. I'm not talking about it as a good or a bad thing. I'm talking about it as a significant social disruption. But OER, Open Educational Resources, offers to us the opportunity to think about whether we can now tackle the need for this transformation. In a similar way, in fact, 10 or 12 years ago, when e-learning first hove into view around the world, similar kinds of discussions and debates were held. And there was great promise held out for how e-learning would transform education. But actually what we've seen from the last 12 to 15 years of e-learning is that the vast majority of practices of integrating the use of ICT into education systems has, forced to re has served to reinforce those traditional models of education rather than to change them. And there's no better expression of that than the learning management system. The learning management system or the virtual learning environment predominantly remains a methodology through which the academic or the educator packages the content that he or she considers to be important and delivers it to the student. So although we don't necessarily now need the lecture hall anymore or the classroom, actually the fundamental transmission model is somewhat unchanged. But ironically, the integration of all that ICT into our education systems has taken place while the education systems themselves have continued operating in exactly the same way as they used to before. So the vast majority of resourcing decisions that are made at both university and school level focus predominantly on how we can put students and lecturers or teachers into the same physical place for confined periods of the day of 45 minutes to an hour at a time and have the teacher talk to the students. And if the teacher's a good teacher, have the students talk back sometimes. So our resourcing models, despite the fact that we've saturated our systems with technology, are continued, continue to be based on a model of face-to-face -face interaction that is completely unchanged from what it was before the technology was introduced. I've been very fortunate to have analyzed education systems around the world, and I feel 100% convinced in saying that if you introduce technology into an education system that is otherwise unchanged, you can only have one of two results, and probably both. The first is that you will drive the cost of running that system up, and the second is that you will drive the quality of that system down. And the reason is quite simple. If I'm going to put technology into the system but everything else stays the same, then the only way in which I can do it is to spend more money than I was before, because no other costs have been cut. But of course, because I can't cut costs, and because I can't add costs, what I do is I put the technology into the system, and I start diverting some of the spending from other parts of the system into the technology investment. 
Of course, the reality under those circumstances is that the way in which we predominantly do that is by expecting our teachers to do more work during the day than they were doing before for the same pay. And that is why, in my experience, the vast majority of academics hate learning management systems. It's because those systems give them extra work to do, but they haven't taken anything away from them in terms of what else they're expected to do. And my contention would be very strongly that that is one of the key reasons why educational portals that distribute and disseminate so much content into the system are so significantly resisted by teachers. Because if I'm a teacher and I look at an educational portal that has lots of free content, what I see first and foremost is something that's expecting me to do more work in order to be a teacher. Now, of course, there are many committed teachers who do that, but actually they're doing it in spite of the system. They're generally having to work harder in order to do it, and nothing that they are doing is reducing the, the big bulk of workload that they are ex expected to transact every day, being in the class with the, with the children, organizing and assigning and marking homework, filling in the millions of administrative bureaucratic forms that are coming from the central government, and various other kinds of phenomena. So it seems to me paradoxical that we introduced ICT without thinking about how we might change any of those things, how we might actually use technology to make the lives of our teachers easier, to reduce their workload. Because what's the point of a productivity tool if it's not actually making you more productive or saving you money? but I can find next to no systemic investments in technology around the world that have systematically tried to identify how they will change the patterns of behavior in the system in order to bring the cost down or to take the productivity up. So unfortunately, we've lost the moment with e-learning to a certain extent, but that's where OER comes into play. Because in the last few years, and I'm afraid I can only speak on behalf of the English-speaking educational community because I can't see what's happening in German or Dutch or other languages because I don't understand them, there has been an absolute explosion of online content. Some of it's junk, some of it's great. But clearly, I think, what this offers to us is the opportunity to rethink how we organize our education systems. Unfortunately, though, I'm sad to say that I think predominantly our efforts to engage with how we use openly licensed content are stuck in the old mindset of how we run education. So largely, we are thinking about the use of open educational resources to either supplement or replace textbooks, or we are thinking about open educational resources as a new way of packaging course content in the traditional university course. And there's no better example of that, although I know for many people a, a MOOC is not OER, depending on how things are licensed. But the vast majority of MOOCs themselves actually reflect exactly that same kind of mindset, that the packaging of content will be done by the academics or the institution and delivered to the students. I can't see any meaningful evidence emerging from those practices that A, they're either tackling the real problems we have, or B, that they will lead to any significant cost benefits in the long run. I think all we will do is move some money around, there'll be a few winners and some losers, but otherwise largely everything will remain the same. If we want to harness this moment, I think it's critical for, under, for us to understand what the real power of OER is. And for me, the real power of OER is this free and open access to information online provides us now with the tools at an affordable level that enable us to reconfigure how we organize our school and university days. They enable us particularly to shift decisively away from those educational models where institutions are organized according to a timetable of lectures or classes. Because what they do is they provide for us the opportunity to put into the hands of the students the ability to take responsibility for their own learning and then to support them on that journey. So this is an experiment that I'm engaging with at the moment in a private school uh, in Johannesburg in South Africa where actually 
the private school is seeking systematically to shift away from a classroom timetable model during the week because they understand that putting children into classes for six hours a day is a tremendously inefficient way of communicating the curriculum. We know from various homeschooling models that if you look at any, well, at, at an average formal curriculum, I can't speak for all countries, so I'll speak for the South African example, if students are able to learn productively all of the time that they are engaging with the content instead of being stuck in a classroom where actually they're only learning for 10 minutes in every 40, that actually you can work through the requirements of the formal curriculum in probably around two to three hours a day instead of having to spend six hours in classes. And the amazing thing is with OER and with cheap devices and with the internet, we already have everything the students need to do that studying. But we fail at the final hurdle because we keep assuming that as educators, as teachers, as the system, we must package that for the students and deliver it to them in a form that is quality controlled and quality assured. Instead of understanding that actually the journey of understanding and thinking about what content is good and what content is bad, making choices, making mistakes, and learning through that process the requirements of the curriculum is actually the best educational experience of all. Because in addition to empowering the students to take responsibility for their own program of learning, instead of reverting to the old system where we tell the students what they will do and when they will do it every moment of the day, we have the opportunity with open content to put those decisions in their hands and then shift the focus and the energy and the attention of the educators away from trying to make all those micro-level decisions for them towards supporting them to be able to make those decisions effectively for themselves. So what we are trying to do at the school that I'm referring to in Johannesburg is create the tools, all of which I think are openly available as open source software applications already, so I don't think any new development is required. It's just a question of packaging them. To enable students to go through, work through content, and then actually be required to construct those teaching and learning resources into coherent learning packages that they can use to study for themselves, and that most importantly, they can then pass on to other students to facilitate their own learning. And we want to do that, first of all, because we are 100% convinced that if the students engage in that way, if they are required to think not only about how they learn, but how they will teach others how to learn, what they are learning, they will become much more productive with the time that they spend learning. And therefore, they will progress through the formal curriculum much faster. But secondly, and much more importantly, that process of having to work through the materials, to think about content, to decide whether it's good or bad, whether it's accurate or inaccurate, whether the source is trustworthy, will help them to develop the real skills that they are going to need for success when they leave school. Because the real skills they will need for success when they leave school is not the fact that they knew all that geography content, but the fact that they learned how to learn all that geography content, and that they were empowered with the skills to make their own decisions about what was good quality and what was bad quality. Because as we've seen, from my early examples of the American sports drink industry or high-fat versus low-fat diets, it's becoming abundantly clear that simply saying that information comes from source X is giving us no assurances that that information is good. More importantly, even if it is good today, the very strong likelihood exists that by the end of next year, it will have been disproven in some form or another. So if we are not equipping our learners to cope with that reality, we are simply not preparing them for the world into which they are moving. And for me, that is critical, not only because it's actually ethically and morally important, but also because the reality, particularly again in the developed world, is that the speed with which technology is disrupting our economies is so fast that if our students have not acquired those skills during their initial education, they are at very serious risk 
of permanent marginalization from society's economies. And we know from the history of the world that large-scale marginalization of young people from the economy is a very bad social idea, which leads to very, very potentially bad and destabilizing consequences over time. So the thing that really interests me about OER is actually the fact that it gives us this moment to reconsider how we are spending time in our system, what we consider to be important to teach our students, and what kinds of roles we consider to be important for our educators. Unfortunately, as I've said, the vast majority of OER practice that I engage with around the world is an uncritical practice that simply replicates the educational methodologies and practices as they've existed largely for the last 150 years. Now, please don't get me wrong. There are many exceptions to that. There's a, a wealth of amazing and great work taking place in the OER field. But unfortunately, it tends to be at the margins, and the systems are continuing to reinvent themselves to co-opt those ideas and to blunt their effectiveness in terms of systemic transformation in ways that I think are really not especially helpful. And so for me, the great opportunity of OER is also its biggest challenge. We have this moment where we can actually think systematically about what kind of education is necessary for our youth. I just hope that over the next three to four years, we don't waste that opportunity as we did with e-learning. Because if we did, I fear that the way in which we will have to reconstruct those education systems will be driven by processes of social change that none of us want to have to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. We have time for some questions and comments. Please wait until the microphone is with you. It's over there. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, you spoke about uh, in a, new, a new system of education and that you OER will transform this, and I agree with you on this. Uh, completely, but uh, I saw in you, as in anyone else who tells me about the new educational revolution of o OER, uh, an emphasis only on schools, while I rarely hear a word about higher education in universities and colleges. Is there some project, some idea going on in this sense also? Uh, by you in South Africa? Um, so, Thank you. I, the basic principles of what I've articulated, I think, apply equally to schools and universities. So, in fact, I would argue that universities are guilty of exactly the same problems in general that the schooling systems are. Um, I've come across countless examples of the opposite experience. So, at the micro level of courses and programs, there is tremendous innovation taking place. Uh, you know, postgraduate programs in which students are doing things in completely different ways, where they are able to engage with and develop these learning skills, even at some undergraduate program levels. But I think, for me, the fundamental problem remains that the vast bulk of the resourcing decisions about how we resource universities are still based on those old assumptions of bringing people together into these very traditional environments. And so my experience, statistically speaking, is that the exceptions are so marginal and so few that they don't really count in the broader social context. Because in the broader social context, the vast majority of students in the, wor in the, wor well, in the context in which I work anyway, at university level, are still being exposed to the very traditional same kind of university experience that's existed for the last couple of hundred years. So, well, no, but again, so, so be clear, Th there are lots of examples of change, but they are micro level. So the innovations that are taking place within some programs, within some courses, within occasionally within the odd faculty here and there, but not very many cases where actually entire university systems and entire institutions are transforming how they operate. And that for me is the major challenge because we need to change those resourcing decisions. Again, that's just based on my experience. 
Of course, the problem with articulating generalizations is that there are always exceptions to the generalizations. So I have no doubt that if we look hard enough, we'll find lots of good examples where transformation is happening. The same applies at the schooling level, by the way. There are lots of schools around the world that are actually changing in the kind of way I'm talking about, that are abandoning the traditional classroom timetable and moving on to other kinds of things. The sad reality for me, though, is that the vast majority of those schools are either private schools or else they are schools that are being allowed to operate outside the confines of the traditional system, like some of the charter schools in the United States, for example. And the vast majority of public schools are still behaving in the same way. So, so my real interest is actually in the big picture, the large-scale change, because I think change, you know, my major concern is that small-scale innovations are actually creating the illusion that change is happening when, in fact, everything is still staying the same at a systemic level. I hope I'm making sense what I'm saying. Next question is over there. I'll talk to you, Biden. Well, thanks, Art, for your inspiring speech. Um, you've said you travel the world. Uh, where are the countries where you think that this has the best, you know, requisition to, to be successful? Um, well, I mean, I think as a, as a matter of simple material reality, uh, the developed world is the place where things have the greatest chance of happening successfully. Um, if, if I just think of some of the presentations I've listened to over the last couple of days, where uh, I'm hearing about entire systems where students already have their own devices, where internet access is ubiquitous, access to content is there, there's portals in place. Uh, from, from that simple resourcing perspective, developed world countries have a great advantage. Unfortunately, they also have some disadvantages, which is that old ways of doing things tend to be more entrenched in the developed world, um, and particularly also that the commercial interests of those people who derive economic value from the system operating in the old way tends to be the strongest. Um, but, I, I, I mean, I, I found sort of examples that are tantalizingly close. For example, I'm doing work in Antigua and Barbuda, where they only have 25 senior secondary schools in total. And they've supplied tablets and LTE connections to every single senior secondary student. And there, the minister is actually committed to transforming the entire system. But one of the difficulties that they face is that the capacity of teachers to respond to that transformation is quite limited. So to impose, you know, sort of jump on them and say, okay, now we're going to transform the way in which the whole system works is going to generate tremendous resistance from many of the teachers who are in that system. And it's not, I think, because they are horrible people, it's just because they're scared and because they're not clear about what the consequences of that change might look like. So, so I think, you know, the bottom line is from what I've seen, there's lots of different countries that have many of the different kinds of ingredients necessary to effect change, but there's very, very few that I've seen that are willing to start actually making those changes on a systematic basis. I think there are a couple that are starting now. Next question is by John Weizmann. Uh, yes, thanks for the, for the nice talk, and I think uh, I'm, I largely agree, but um, don't you think you're missing a certain very important factor there, which is that there's different types of uh, humans, of traditions, of whole nations that don't really appreciate this um, empowering um, function that you have in your, um, the, the idea to make the people able to choose for themselves, I mean, some societies see that as threatening to, um, to long-standing traditions and all this, and they, they have a valid point. I mean, this is not, we, we cannot really put the same model of how a human life should be self, uh, you know, um, the decisions made by yourself or not should be the same for everybody on the planet. So I think you should maybe think whether there's, um, another factor that you need to put into your uh, argumentation? Um, I, first of all, I, I was quite careful to steer away from articulating what I thought a future vision of a system would look like. Because I don't think anyone knows. And I think that anyone who argues forcefully that they understand what the future model of education looks like is either selling you something or is delusional. So. So I think you're right that there is no one-size-fits-all model that we can cross-apply to everywhere and that will solve all the problems. But I think that actually, and, and, sorry, and I agree with you 100% as well, that there are many vested interests and many traditional mindsets about how to do things and many power bases that are based on not empowering people 
to make their own decisions that will tend to mitigate against educational transformation taking place. I think that's all absolutely correct. I don't think, though, that that's a good argument for not engaging with educational transformation. And I think that we are starting to see that by ignoring the requirement to create different kinds of educational systems, the people who are responsible for managing and running those education systems are actually opening those societies up to a very significantly different kind of risk, which is the risk of large-scale marginalization of people from the economy. And I think there's very little doubting that the evidence around the world that there are growing and growing numbers of people who are being marginalized from the mainstream economy. And most of those people who are marginalized from the, from the economy unfortunately lack any of the kind of educational preparation they need to get back into the economy given how it's transformed. And so I can't see any good reason why anyone who has any serious interest in maintaining social growth and stability wouldn't want to engage with this challenge because I think by ignoring it, we're just opening up to a much greater risk. Having said that, though, I'm not trying to suggest that there is one new model that can be imposed unilaterally on every country, because clearly there are different contexts that need to be taken into account. I hope that makes sense, what I'm saying. Next question. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, talk. If you follow your, your line of argumentation, and, and I'm willing to do so, what would you re recommend as three concrete next steps one should do? Because, I mean, what you propose is not a small change. So how to address this? Okay. Very practically. Sure. So I think and, I mean, the first step is going to be a stupid step because I know very few countries that are actually willing to do this. But I think the first step that has to take place is that the central bureaucracies that are responsible for running education need to go systematically and look through the policies that have accumulated in their systems over the last 50 years and work out which ones they're going to dismantle. Because I think the first and most fundamental problem that education systems face is that actually central bureaucracies have grown and continue to grow the number of requirements that they impose on the periphery, on the local schooling or university environment, the numbers of administrative functions they need to fulfill. We also know from the experience of countries like South Korea and Finland that those countries that actually impose the fewest of those bureaucratic requirements on education systems tend to be the ones with the best functioning education systems. But the reality is that the vast majority, if not all, central bureaucracies have proliferated the administrative burden on the system. And I think that to find the answers to the kinds of problems I'm putting to you, we first have to free up the time of people at the local level, the teachers, the educators, the academics, the principals, the rectors, etc., to be able to grapple with the problem. So that would be step, absolute step number one for me. Step number two would be that I would strongly suggest that all investments in OER should focus exclusively on the student. Too much of what we're doing, in my view, is focusing on supporting the teacher instead of going directly to the student and providing tools and resources to students that will facilitate their learning. We've seen paradoxically that those things from outside the system, like the Khan Academy, that have gone straight to the student are the ones that have run on a scale that those teacher-based systems dream of. But the main reason why I would do that is again the same. Because I think if we construct effectively those student support systems, what we can do is free up the time of teachers to engage with the other challenges that they need to tackle. Because if they know for sure that there are reliable tools and systems and resources that they can draw on that can get their students to learn in different kinds of ways, then that can start to free up their time. I would again then place with that strong emphasis on tackling the management challenge. And again, for me, that has to involve empowerment. In most systems that I work with, the, the school principals, the university, even the university vice chancellors, despite the fact that university vice chancellors and the university system goes on about academic freedom and so on, actually the vast majority of public schooling and university systems are tremendously constrained in, kind, in terms of the kinds of decisions that they can make. And so what I would be driving as the third leg of that is a sustained level of management engagement that focuses very strongly on decentralizing responsibility for management and decision making. So that then the new models of education that we need to construct can emerge more freely from the local. We need, in my view, to go to education systems that place greater trust in what happens at the local level and less emphasis on trying to regulate and control everything from the center. I think that's the only way we'll find the right solutions. 
So I, I hope that's useful. Are there more questions? Anyone? All right. I think maybe you don't know, but I think you have spoken a lot about Germany because there are very old and very new ideas. A very old idea is what we call Bildung, which is an idea that's hard to translate in any other languages. And there are new ideas, for example, the discussion on German schools, for example, with the Deutsche Schulpreis, these are schools awarded as the best schools in Germany every year, which is very similar to your ideas, that it's not about teaching, but about learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful for your talk. I think it was the perfect closing keynote for this conference. Thank you very much, Neil Butcher. Thank you.